Hello, Rancho Mirage. I am so happy to be here, not just because of your beautiful climate, because it means I'm out of Washington. <laughs> I've spent most of my life covering wars. I never knew that I'd, in my own country, cover such a nasty conflict. So I'm going back to the Middle East in a few weeks. I first landed in the Middle East on October 6, 1973. It was the year the Fourth Middle East War broke out. I landed in Beirut, and a woman, as I walked into the terminal, whispered to me, the Egyptians have just crossed the Suez Canal. I was 24 years old. I'd never covered a war. What history? Life is serendipitous, and in the intervening decades, I've covered every war, revolution, and uprising in the Middle East, and most of them elsewhere in the world as well. Over 140 countries on seven continents. Uh, my dad once said that he didn't dare go to Bermuda with me on vacation because surely there'd be a coup d'etat. <laughs> every time I landed someplace, there was a crisis. A lot of my friends say, where are you going on vacation next? <laughs> so I want to do three things this morning, and uh, I, I want to leave some time for questions. If uh, The Middle East is a broad region, and a lot of people have very specific issues. I thought what would be useful is to talk about three things. One is Islamic extremism, terrorism, something that has defined our national security now for a very long time. The second is to look at the broader trends across the region. What defines the Middle East today, and how is it different? And the third is to talk about Iran. I've now been to Iran more than any American since the revolution. I first went there during the Shah's era. Uh, I've interviewed the last five Iranian presidents, and uh, it is a country that may well define our next war. So I thought those would be the three useful things to try to talk about this morning. We actually have something to celebrate in the Middle East for a change, and that is the demise of ISIS and the caliphate and the death of its emir, Baghdadi. I've spent five years on the front lines in Syria and Iraq, and that's where I'm going back uh, next month. A year ago, I was on the front lines as the caliphate was collapsing. I was in Mosul the New York of Iraq, and then I went into Syria and was on the front lines as ISIS collapsed. I talked to um, members of ISIS, including some Americans, one from Chicago. I went to the large prison where thousands of ISIS prisoners are being held and talked to the emir of ISIS, who had been responsible as he talked about it for the deaths of hundreds of people, including 40 women who he'd put in a cage and set on fire. Uh, so I've seen it up close. And one of the things that we don't really understand about ISIS and the challenge that extremism presents is it's not just the way it kills people and destroys a home. It's the institutions that it destroys as well. And one of the most moving things I did was go to Mosul University one of the oldest universities in the Middle East. And I went to the library. This is a place that has over a million books, or I should say had more than a million books, including books that were more than a thousand years old, and ISIS burned it down. This was a place of learning, and this was a source of education for the next generation to create an alternative. And the only other people on the campus at that point, because uh, the, the fighting was still going on, was a team from the Iraqi army that was dismantling the little mines, the IEDs that ISIS had left behind. And they were finding and demining hundreds every day. And they lost several members who had died finding these things. And they pulled them out and showed them to me. And they'd taken um, all kinds of different small devices so that you almost wouldn't see them. And with dental floss, 
as a tripwire. They'd put them in waste baskets across door jams in windows so that people wouldn't see them. I came away with a whole new respect and fear for dental floss. <laughs> At the height of the caliphate, ISIS controlled a third of Iraq, a third of Syria, and more basically, it redefined the modern borders of the Middle East. If it had prevailed, it would have had, I think, sweeping con co uh, consequences for the w rest of the region. It was a state the size of Indiana, with the army of 70,000 foreign fighters, and that's not including the locals, who were the majority. It ruled over 8 million people, and it produced more than a million dollars of income a day. And it had gone global. We forget that it was not just the caliphate. In three years, ISIS and its sympathizers were responsible for over 140 attacks in 29 countries. They killed more than 2,000 people. So it was a global threat. Its followers attacked Barcelona and Brussels, Copenhagen and Columbus, Ohio, Orlando and London. It had real global sweep. So the caliphate has now collapsed, but ISIS is not finished. And that's one thing we need to understand, that for all the celebration and all the language about ISIS is defeated, that in fact it isn't. It still has 14,000 fighters along the border of Iraq and Syria. It's waging an insurgency that kills people every single day. We don't read about it because American lives are not, at the moment, being lost. It also has branches that are active in Libya and Egypt and the Sinai, and I think, very importantly, in Afghanistan. Who would have thought that the Taliban might become an, a group that we wanted to engage with because there was someone that was actually far more dangerous? So. What happened with the caliphate really also underscores the trends in modern terrorism. And I've covered all of them uh, since the early 1970s. I lived in Beirut for five years, and the very first suicide bomb against an American target was against the American embassy in Beirut. It was down the office from, or down the street from my office, and I remember racing down there when the bomb went off, and the front of the building, seven stories, had been sheared off like a doll's house, and people and furniture were dangling from the sides. And I watched as rescuers picked up bits of body and put them in blue plastic bags, and some of these people were my friends. I understand terrorism up close. I lived in Beirut six months later when another suicide bomber drove into the marine compound. Marine peacekeepers. It was the largest non-nuclear explosion anywhere on Earth since World War II. It was the largest loss of US military life in a single incident since Iwo Jima. And again, I was awakened by the bomb. I can still hear it 37 years later, 39 years later, going off in my head. And again, many of the Marines I had known and written about while I was there. All three bombings were carried out by the embryo of what became Hezbollah, the party of God in Beirut. And I want to come back to that in a minute. But one of the things that's really interesting is the tectonic shift in the trend lines of terrorism. So a recent survey looked at 450 groups around the world and found some very helpful statistics. One is that only 5% of terrorist groups ever succeed, ever achieve their goals, and usually because they have political aspirations or they want a piece of property and they have broad international support. The most obvious example of this is in South Africa, the ANC. People forget that Nelson Mandela was arrested because he formed the armed wing of the African National Congress, and it engaged in five 
bombings on the same day in three different South African towns. He was arrested for sabotage and sentenced to life imprisonment. But the international community, because apartheid is an odious ideology, supported the cause of the African National Council, believed that white minority rule was not su successful. I was actually in Soweto in South Africa, the largest black township on the day of the first black mass uprising in 1976. And I went back 14 years later and watched Nelson Mandela walk to freedom. It's fascinating. There are groups that have legitimate beefs turned to violence, achieve their goals, 5%. Another 18% of terrorist groups end up negotiating. I knew Yasser Arafat when I lived in Beirut, when he was the world's foremost terrorist, when the PLO was engaged in hijackings and uh, attacks on Israel, hostage takings. But I all, and I, when I lived in Beirut, I also watched him, after the Israeli invasion in 1982, sail off to Tunis. Looked like he was going to fight a war from a different front. But what was so fascinating is that 11 years later, he was in Washington, and I was on the South Lawn of the White House watching as he signed a peace deal with Yitzhak Rabin. I never would have thought that possible. But we've seen that happen elsewhere, whether it's FARC in Colombia, the IRA in Northern Ireland. They end up negotiating to get at least part of what they want to achieve. The third trend is that, on average, a terrorist group can only survive eight years if it uses only violence. What's interesting is that those groups that are considered extremists survive longer than that when they begin to provide an alternative. And that's where I get back to Hezbollah. Since 1993, when, when Hezbollah came from the underground in Lebanon, and created a political party and ran for parliament. It has become a political power in Lebanon. The Christian president is its ally. Its brand new prime minister was its candidate. It holds seats in cabinet. It has se is the second largest bloc in parliament. And it is the second largest employer in Lebanon after the Lebanese government. It has created an alternative to the state, to an inefficient, corrupt state. And that's one of the things we have to worry about, is helping countries or societies get beyond their current inept, inequitous, unjust governments so that groups like Hezbollah don't create alternatives. So let me turn uh, to the broader Middle East. And one thing I want everyone to understand is we tend to look at the Middle East as separate, as uh, of its own region, its own uh, characteristics, when in fact what's happening in that region, which is today the world's most volatile, is part and parcel of broader changes across the region, across the world over the last three decades with the end of communism in Eastern Europe, the demise of milita military dictatorships in Latin America, the end of minority rule and apartheid in Africa. Everywhere you find this quest for ideas, for leadership to get us through this awkward transition, I don't have time to talk about it, but I think today the transition we're witnessing in the early 21st century is arguably the most important, the most profound, and the most sweeping in the last 500 years, when we saw city-states become nation-states, and now as we move to globalization. And the problem is we don't know how to get there, but there's no stopping it. But that, as I said, is a separate topic. Why? is the Middle East, the last region to join this trend. What are the factors? And I think there are four. The first is demographics. The majority of the population across the Middle East is young. Under, it differs from country to country, under 30, under 25, uh, in one case, under 20. And they are the largest block 
And they are at that point that they are beginning to participate. And what's fascinating is the intersection with demographics, with education. For the first time in the 22 Arab countries, the majority are literate. And that includes the girls. Any time now. <laughs> so you have the intersection of young population that's literate, and that gives them the ability to understand what's happening elsewhere in the world with the change. They know what their rights are, and they want them. They don't want to be separate from the rest of the world. And then you have simple things like technology and satellites, in the mid-1990s, there was one independent satellite television station across the whole Middle East, Al Jazeera, that could circumvent state censorship and state control. Today, there are over 500 independent satellite television stations, and they have diverse programming when it comes to religion, political debate, soap operas, talk shows. And the bottom line is that for the first time, there is no one way, no one religious interpretation, that there, the idea of diversity is now ingrained among the majority of the population which is educated. And then you have social media, which helps those who are willing to take action circumvent the ability of the state to stop them. And so we saw the Arab Spring. And my book, Rock the Casbah, captures this extraordinary moment in Middle East history. And a lot of people say it failed. Well, I think this is where we don't understand the patterns of global change. As I said, I witnessed the change in South Africa. And when you look at South Africa today, the average black is worse off than they were under apartheid. When you look at the aftermath of the Soviet Union, we have Vladimir Putin in power, who was going to be in power till 2024, but he's just changing the political system, so he may be president for life. Democratic change comes in waves. Sam Huntington and Alvin Toffler wrote about the three waves. The first, see, the first wave is the seeding of ideas. The second wave is it takes root. And the third is it flowers. But after each wave, there is a rollback. And we've seen that elsewhere. Democracy is really hard to achieve and even harder to sustain. So, I like to tell the occasional human story just to show you how profound the change is. And one of my favorite stories is about a young Egyptian girl named Dahlia, Dahlia Ziada. And Dahlia was, she came from a lower middle class family. And on her 12th birthday, her mother said to her that she was taking her to a special celebration and that she was to put on her best dress. And she thought this was some kind of surprise party. And she was instead taken for her circumcision. More than 80%, some say 90, uh, of girls in Egypt, and it's not a religious thing, it's both Christian and Muslim, Muslim and Christian, are circumcised, even though it was outlawed. And this was, had such a profound impact on her that she decided that she was going to campaign within her family to make sure her sisters and her cousins didn't have to go through this. And she failed and failed and failed till it came to her last cousin. And she sat up with her uncle all night arguing, and she said, if you do this to her, I'm going to cut off her finger. And her uncle said, well, that will disable her. And she said, that's the point. And so she thought she'd failed, and the next day he came to her and said, you convinced me.
So she then decided to take the subject, and she was a teenager, and talk about this in her school. This was a taboo subject in public. And she created momentum and discussion about this that led to beyond her school and across Cairo. So when she went to college, and she was the first in her family uh, to go to college, she decided she wanted to, uh, because she loved films, she wanted to create the first Arab human rights film festival. And so she organized, mobilized some student activists, and they came up with a list of movies, and, uh, and then they were told that the censorship board wouldn't approve them. So Dahlia went down to the censorship board, and she waited at the elevator bank, and she... Uh, come on, folks. Uh, and she waited for him, and she rode up in the elevator, she made her case, and she eventually convinced him. Well, then the theater found out that its license to show films had been suspended, you know, just coincidentally, of course. And so she and her friends organized the equivalent of bake sales and raised money. And they rented a Nile River boat uh, used for tourist cruises, and they went down and they showed their films in the first film festival. So one of the young uh, people who attended came up to her and said, if I make a film about Egypt, because of course there were no human rights films about Egypt, would you show it next year? And she said yes. And the next year, a film one minute long was shown, and in it, a flower came out of the earth and bloomed, and then another and then another. And then scissors came through and snipped each flower, and with each snip, a girl screamed. One minute. So, Dahlia, then, as Tahrir happened during the Arab Spring, decided she wanted to find some vehicle to help people understand civil disobedience. So she heard about a comic book in the United States about the Montgomery story, the story of Martin Luther King. And she got a hold of it, and she translated it, and she, she got an NGO in Egypt to help publish 2,000 of them. And she was out at Tower Square passing out her stories. And in the back of the comic book, and what was so interesting about it was that it had instructions on civil disobedience and what it means and how to do it peacefully. So, after the ouster of President Mubarak in the first democratic elections, Dahlia decided she was going to run for parliament. And Tahrir Square was in her district. She didn't win, but she said afterwards that it was worth having the experience of knowing how to run a campaign, how to reach out, how to use the tools of social media to get her message out. And she said, now I know how to run, and I intend to be the first female president of Egypt. Now, she won't, but this is how deep the change is. And when we talk about these kind of abstract education and demographics and females and so forth, she's a living example of what is possible. The problem with the Arab Spring, of course, is the kids knew what they opposed, and they knew how to protest, and they were brave enough to go out on the streets. But they didn't have the leadership. These are kids. They didn't have the political maturity or the experience. They didn't have political parties. And they didn't know how to create something that they could all be for. And as a result, you saw what has been a very messy transition, and the emergence of President El Sisi a former field marshal who, um, that's a separate subject, but who is far worse than President Mubarak was when it comes to human rights violations. Nobody's paying much attention to Egypt, but there are tens of thousands of people who've been detained. Uh, an American citizen just died in one of, uh, one of the Egyptian jails in the last month. Um, again, we've seen the first wave, 
It's how do you get to the second. And one of the problems, too, is the idea of leadership. And where do you look to? Who emerges? Where are the ideas? The Nasserism of Egypt of the 70s, the Baathism of Iraq and Syria, of Saddam Hussein and Bashar al-Assad, are outdated, obsolete, ineffective, unjust, recognized widely as having failed. And as a result, what's filled this vacuum across the region is jihadism. And that's why we have to be concerned that whether it's ISIS or the dregs of Al-Qaeda, that it's not over. So I want to tell you one story about one of my favorite countries, and that's Tunisia, this gem of a country squished between Algeria and Libya on the Mediterranean coast with these beautiful beaches and the famous bird cages with the bulbous tops. The Arab Spring began in Tunisia when a young fruit vendor who had been harassed over and over and over by state authorities, demanded bribes over and over and over. A police inspector came and demanded $7. That was what he made in a day, and he supported his five siblings, his uh, mother, his ailing uncle. And the police inspector also took his scale, his one piece of equipment. He sold fruit off a cart in a public square. He was so outraged about over and over and over having been demanded to pay bribes that he went from government office to government office to get back his scale, to get back his produce. And when he was turned away time and time again, he finally went to the governor's office and he poured paint thinner all over his body and he set himself on fire. Uh, he survived a couple of weeks and then he died of his burns. He lived in a city called Sidi Bouzid. So a year later, I went back to Sidi Bouzid, and I went to the street corner where Mohammed Bouazizi sold his produce, and I said to the young fruit vendors who were selling fruit there, so what do you think, a year later? And they all said the same thing. We have far more freedoms, and we have far fewer jobs and the problem of corruption isn't over. So in 2014, I went back as an international monitor for Tunisia's first democratic election for president. And Tunisia was the one success story to come out of this. They wrote a constitution that even gives women equal rights. What country that we know of hasn't given women equal rights? They held two years of town halls to make sure, across the country to make sure everyone's views were incorporated. What was really stunning was this place that had inspired the ouster, a, a, a wave of protest that ousted four leaders that together had ruled their country's total of more than 100 years. Only 32% of the population turned out the lowest population group to participate were the young, and the city that had the lowest turnout was City Bouzid. Expectations hadn't been met, and people in a very short time, three years, had begun to feel like the system had failed them. And what was striking in 2014, later that year, as ISIS began sweeping across the Middle East, was that little Tunisia, 11,000 people, 11 million people, 5,000 ended up joining ISIS, the largest of any country. Another 9,000 were stopped from leaving the country. And that's where we get to the issue of creating ideas and alternatives. When we talk about foreign aid or U.S. intervention, we so often think in terms of military aid or security aid. And what people really need in all of these countries is the kind of economic support that allows them to create jobs and take care of the young and make them feel that with their education. The irony of Tunisia is that it had the highest proportion of college graduates, but it couldn't provide them with jobs. And so that gap then created a vacuum where people turned to extremism or an ideology that gave them power, income, and in many cases, 
a gun. So what's interesting today is that we're seeing the beginnings of what could be a second wave. In Iraq, protests have defined the political horizon in several cities since October 1st. Hundreds have been killed. In Lebanon, what started as a protest over a small increase in taxes on WhatsApp, the app that you can call or message people for free and it's encrypted. It's how I communicate with uh, many of my foreign sources. Tiny increase, and that triggered a protest that then led to people questioning the legitimacy of the government itself and demanding that it step down. And the government did step down. And you see as well in Iran, the protest in November, which was started by a four cent increase in a liter of gas. In an, I mean, it was still the cheapest gas in the world, but it was a four cent increase. And there was a sense of uh, that the system was not providing, it was asking for more and not providing more. So uh, the common message in all this, in all of these protests today is they're angry at elites, they're angry at unjust systems, they're angry at the failure of economic, of the economic system to deliver jobs, income, a sense of security, a future, and corruption. And I'm very pleased to, s to say that women are, again, on the forefront of some of these protests. It's no longer a male-dominated world in the region. So time is so short, and I can't resist talking about Iran because it's one I know so well, and, um, and so few have an opportunity to visit. To me, it's one of the richest, uh, most interesting countries in the region. So, so many of the countries in the Middle East are, have been defined in the last, their borders defined, their governments created, their systems created only in the last century, in the aftermath of World War I. Iran's history goes back more than 5,000 years. And this is where um, uh, one of my favorite stories is about Cyrus. Cyrus was the first emperor of the first great empire in the world, and he also introduced the first idea of human rights. And this is how Iranians look at themselves. They don't look at themselves in terms of the revolution, uh, kind of the, the sliver of modern history. So Cyrus preached that power was only legitimate when it was bestowed by the people, where the majority of people believed that the leader was legitimate. And uh, one of Socrates' students was so enamored of this idea that he wrote something called the Cyropedia, the Cy Encyclopedia of Cyrus. And it became very influential in the thinking of many modern, or many leaders throughout history, Machiavelli, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson had two copies of the Cyropedia. He wrote his... Uh, grandson, that to understand democracy, you had to begin with Cyrus. And in 1879, British uh, archaeologists in what is today's Iraq discovered a baked clay cylinder that about the size of a rugby ball, that in tiny cuneiform writing in the first person by Cyrus, described why he believed power came from the people. The Cyrus Cylinder, about four years ago, came to Washington and was shown at the Smithsonian. And in a case next to it was Thomas Jefferson's Cyropedia, underlined. It's one of my favorite stories. And it's just to, to try to explain that Iran is much more than its current political system. So I covered the revolution, I covered the takeover of the U.S. Embassy, I stood at the foot of the steps of the plane in Algiers when the 52 Americans flew to freedom, many of them my friends. Uh, I, 34 years later, I actually got back into the U.S. Embassy, which is a museum that still has the terrible gold shag carpeting from the 1970s. Uh, it, now has labels on various American um, 
uh, equipment, forgery machine that shows how they made false passports and so forth. It's, it's riveting. But revolutions often produce circumstances that lead to their own undoing. Uh, in two weeks, Iran will celebrate its 41st anniversary. Something interesting has happened. My favorite story about modern Iran is that after the revolution, the mullahs called on women to breed an Islamic generation, and boy, did they. The population in one decade went from 32 million to 60 million. The average family had over seven children. And it was the moment that the mullahs recognized, oh, whoops, we can't feed, clothe, house, educate, and eventually employ all those people. So it introduced a family planning program. Everything was free. Pill, IUD, Norplant, tubal ligation, vasectomy. The water tower in Tehran, in English and Farsi, vasectomy clinic here. <laughs> they hired 35,000 women to go door to door like Avon ladies, preaching the benefits of family planning. Your children will have better education, there'll be more resources, you'll have more time to be a good mother and develop your own life. It'll be good for defense of the nation because we'll have more resources. Uh, they also, to get married, introduced a family planning program. And every couple, to get a marriage license, had to go through it. So I decided to go to one of them. They are very graphic. <laughs> Huge phallus, you know, pulled a, a condom over. You know, I learned a lot. <laughs> Iran brought the average family size to 1.8, lower than replacement, in a decade, won the UN's highest award for effective and non-coercive family planning. But what happened was, for that decade where they produced so many kids, the majority of the population in Iran is now that baby boom generation. The majority of voters are now from that generation, all born after the revolution. And they are what I call the determinators. They are the ones who are defining the political future. And they are the ones who aren't happy with the revolution, want something different, have increasingly taken to the streets to protest. They were responsible for the Green Movement in 2009 when millions turned out to protest voter fraud in the presidential election. Iran is going through a major transition. The supreme leader is going to be 81 in July. Mo many of the leading revolutionaries have begun to die out. And they know that to sustain the Islamic Republic, they are going to have to accommodate the majority of its population. And that's why Iran went to the negotiating table with the United States in 2013 and engaged in two years of diplomacy on a nuclear deal. I don't want to get into it, the good or the bad, imperfect as it was. It was, historically, the most important non-proliferation agreement in 25 years. You know, President Reagan had said that Pakistan would never get a bomb, and it did. And Clinton said North Korea would never get a bomb, and it did. And now we're dealing with the issue of Iran and the nuclear deal put off for up to 25 years, Iran's ability to do, engage in anything, and to promise, in perpetuity, never to develop a nuclear weapon. Now, whether you like what the current state of play, the bottom line is that Iran doesn't want a war with the United States. And I don't think the United States wants a war with Iran. What I worry about is the kind of tit-for-tat exchanges that escalate, that as Iran feels squeezed by the current policy of maximum pressure, that it engages in more and more provocations, whether it's shooting down an American drone, um, uh, putting Saudi Arabia in check on its, uh, by attacking its oil. Uh, if Iran can't export oil, it doesn't want others in the, in the region to export oil either. So we're in this incredible transition, and it applies in Iran, it, it, it applies across the broader Middle East, and I have five minutes for questions if anyone wants to ask about something else. Um, I'm happy to talk about any country. I'm happy to talk about...
Well, I'm not happy to talk about U.S. policy, but I will. Um, so, yes, ma'am. Uh, will I address the targeted assassination or killing of uh, Qasem Soleimani? So Qasem Soleimani was head of the kind of Navy SEALs or Delta Force of Iran, the Iran's elite unit of the Revolutionary Guards that engaged in um, foreign expeditionary policy. It, um, it aided groups in Syria. It's been pivotal in keeping Bashar Assad in power. Uh, but it also was instrumental in helping the Kurds in Iraq fight off ISIS. ISIS was a threat to Iran, too, because it came within 25 miles of its border. And ISIS was a Sunni jihadi group. Iran is a Shiite country. And, and so their issue is security and and they look at the security of, of Syria as an ally, as an important thing, but also the, the stability in Iraq and the elimination of an extremist movement in Iraq as top priorities. So the, the problem, I mean, we can all celebrate that he's gone. The problem is Iraq has, Iran has a very deep bench. It fought an eight-year war with Iraq. It has, its revolutionary guards are hardened fighters. Um, and the same day, they appointed a new head. He may not be as flamboyant or as um, social media savvy, but he is, he's been, he was Qasem Soleimani's deputy for 20 years. Um, Soleimani dealt with Iran's Western Front and a man named uh, Ishmael Ghani dealt with the Eastern Front. There's a real danger that, that we tactically eliminated an immediate threat. My concern is that we don't have a broad strategy. And this, I think, applies in many foreign policy areas. We tend, whatever administration, to react, to counter whatever we see as a threat. But we are not very good proactively ab about trying to promote our values, our economic strengths, to use our resources in ways that are that are um, that help create environments where you don't see extremism emerge. One more. I write for the New Yorker. Uh, I write about these issues a lot. I wrote a book called Rock the Casbah. Uh, the you, you, you so, of the Middle East or the world? The world. The world. Stay tuned, that's my next book. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I'm starting it next week. Uh, it has a, a, a working subtitle called Rogues, Heroes, Mercenaries, and a Pope. Um, and it's really about this extraordinary period of change in history that I've witnessed and, and where we're headed. Um, so thank you for asking the question. Thank you very much.